Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It is very good to be in worship with you today. Thank you, Dennis, for the beautiful welcome to worship this morning. Um, as we usually do, I'll start out with a few announcements this morning, and, and feel free to add any um, that I might not go over. Just a reminder that masks are optional. Um, if you choose to wear one, that is absolutely fine. Just uh, please ask anybody before you hug them, make sure they're okay with that also. Um, feel free, if you have joys or concerns, to leave those in the chat online. If you're not in worship with us in the building this morning, uh, we will still definitely pray for you, um, and we will rejoice with you in, in your praises also. Uh, if you have an offering this morning, and you're in-house for worship, there's a little church building in the back you're welcome to place that into. And uh, if you're online and you want to give to the church, uh, you can always send to the P.O. Box. Um, that's always available, and thank you so much for that. Our new worship time will begin at 1045, that is next Sunday. Um, don't forget that, 1045, back here in this same space. Vacation Bible School is coming along very soon. Um, if you have any questions or uh, thoughts, ideas, or you just want to volunteer to help, which would be fantastic. Just speak with Lyndon. She would greatly appreciate that. And first and foremost, keep Vacation Bible School in your prayers, as we uh, did not have the opportunity um, to do VBS last year. It'll be a, a more difficult thing to get back going again this year. So just be in prayer uh, about the ministry of this church and reaching out into the community again to experience Vacation Bible School. Are there any other announcements this morning that I might have missed. All right, seeing none, if you would please stand with me. We're going to sing hymn number 394, Something Beautiful. And we're going to sing this twice through. please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we stand here before you this morning in, in your presence. Um, God, and that is beautiful. Thank you for taking our, our misunderstanding and our confusion in life, and God, thank you for making something beautiful out of that. God, uh, this beautiful bouquet that you've created this morning in this sanctuary, we are so thankful for. It is so good to hear Voices coming together to sing, to see smiles, sun faces, and just to have this opportunity to freely worship together. God, we are so, so thankful for that. God, we just pray your presence be on every ounce of what we do here this morning, and may we glorify you with all of it. In your name we pray. Amen. And you may be seated. Our opening scripture this morning comes from Psalm chapter 30. Psalm chapter 30, and I am going to read it in its entirety. And I'll be doing that from the NIV version of the Bible. Psalm 30. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. O Lord, my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. 
O Lord, you brought me up from the grave. You spared me from going down into the pit. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I will never be shaken. O Lord, when you favored me, you made my mountain stand firm. But when I hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What gain is there in my destruction, in going down into the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my help. You turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy, that my heart may sing to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give you thanks forever. The word of God for the people of God. Well, social distance this morning. I'm addressing this to Pastor Sarah, but you stand there. I'll stand here. We'll be all set. <laughs> Oops. I told Pastor Sarah that I had a presentation of sorts for her this morning, and I promised her it would be uplifting because this is a day of praise, but I do have to start by telling you this story that um, somehow in conversation it came up with Landon that Pastor Sarah was no longer going to be Pastor Sarah to us, just Sarah, and he wanted to know why, of course, and all that. But in his almost four-year-old wisdom, he summed it up by saying, that makes me sad. And he was exactly right in the innocence of a child. But this is a positive, uplifting thing. So when thinking as a representative, as the lay leader of the church, it's my honor and privilege to represent all the laity of the church to you. I thought, what can we give you? And I thought, you have given us your heart for six years, so we are giving you our hearts in the form of a scrapbook that we will present to you. We also have a card with the token of our appreciation in that. So in order to not babble or blumber through this entire thing, I will just read to you what I feel the representative of the congregation would like to say to you. Because this is a day of rejoicing and a day of blessing. Pastor Sarah, what a blessing it has been to have been in ministry with you at the North Fairfield United Methodist Church. It has been our honor and privilege to get to know you and your wonderful family. You and your family will forever be a part of this family. Six years ago, you were appointed as our quarter time pastor, but you have given us 100% of your heart as you have led us in worship and shared with us the wonderful words of scripture in a way that have blessed us and brought us closer to Christ. You have lifted us up in prayer during times of loss and illness and fear, and you have rejoiced with us in times of joy. You are a wonderful servant of God, and you have been blessed with so many wonderful qualities. In filling out our annual pastor assessment forms, the leadership team is asked to come up with at least three areas of strength. The team always came up with so many positive adjectives to describe you that it was a struggle to fit them into the space allowed. We think we got it right, though, when in 2020, we were able to come up with this description. Pastor Sarah is compassionate and approachable. She makes people feel comfortable and able to talk to her and work with her. Her love for her family, both at home and her church family, is very evident. She is a strong worship leader through preaching, prayer, and sharing. She is also able to relate the Bible in a way that makes it relevant to daily living, especially during these difficult times. She is a cooperative leader. She is able to see the strengths in others and help to develop them. She is non-threatening and open to new ideas and change. She has great awareness of the people and situations around her. She is humble, honest, sincere, authentic, and accountable. She has reasonable expectations of herself and others. God has called you to ministry and you listened and acted upon it and we have been blessed abundantly because of that action. Now you have heard God calling you to go in a different direction, and you listened and are acting upon it. It is a bittersweet for us because we will miss you as our pastor and all that you bring to that role, but we rejoice with you in the possibilities that lie ahead for you and your family. We also rejoice to those whose lives you will touch as you re redefine your ministry to others. 
We have been blessed to be the, the first-hand recipients of your love and compassion and your awesome gifts of sharing God's word. We have the unique and wonderful privilege of being able to continue to be in ministry with you because of your connection and our connection to Fitchville United Methodist Church. We look forward to being able to continue to work with you, and we also look forward to seeing what God has planned for you as you continue to follow his call upon your life. You recently expressed a hope that if we only learned one thing from you, it was that Jesus loves us. We ass be assured that we know of that love. We have heard Christ's love from your words. We have seen Christ's love in your actions and your care of us and others. And we have felt Christ's love straight from your heart. We know that Jesus loves us and that we love you, your church family. I too have written something for this time, and I will probably blubber through it, but you did excellent, so uh, that's a hard shoes to fill there on many accounts. So I had to write this so that I wouldn't just blubber and blubber, and I got tissues too, so we're ready. So I'd like to take this time today, this moment of gratitude, to express to this faith community my deepest gratitude for the journey that we have traveled together these last six years. I have told so many people that I hit the lotto with this appointment. My time serving alongside each of you and your families has been a joy and a privilege. As I think back over the years, it's hard to believe that it has gone so quickly, so quickly that we might have forgotten all of the ministry and all of the life that we have experienced together. My mind goes back to many moments, many accomplishments, some failures along the way, and to me that is being the church, a faith family that experiences life, that serves the community, that isn't afraid to say, well, we didn't get that quite right, a family that is seeking to become more Christ-like together. I think back early on to the exploding fizzy stuff of VBS that occurred in the side yard. But I remember, too, there was some exploding fizzy stuff in the sanctuary. And as a new pastor, that made me really nervous until I realized the trustees were here and they seemed okay with it. I wish I could remember all of the VBS tunes, but I cannot. But I am forever impressed with those who can and those who can get their legs and their arms to go the right way at the right time. I am impressed with that. I think about the mountains of toilet paper that we collected and how handy that would have been during the pandemic. I think about the making and packing of cookies at Christmas, serving soup in the drive through and welcoming families to a meal and to a musical. But it was more than food and song. It was Jesus shared with children and with their families. I wondered to myself if there could have been a few more breakfasts that were made in the waffle iron, or did Matt and his crew exhaust all of the possibilities? I was thinking about Dwayne trying his very best to get the rest of us to like grits. And I don't care how you dress him up, I still don't want him. <laughs> there was the stone soup, the breakfast casseroles, all of the many kinds of chilies. There were the hot dogs that we saw at BBS on Monday, and then miraculously again on Sunday in the square uptown. And if you weren't sure, that's a five loaves and two fish kind of miracle. There was the mysterious way that Sloppy Joes became tacos, tacos became spaghetti. That's a water into wine kind of miracle. And we can't forget about the peach cobbler and the ice cream. Although we're two years without it now and there's something wrong with that. So you should rebirth that. And I know we're Methodists, but the ministry here was not just about the food. There were games too. There was camping and canoeing and slip and bleeds. There was dodgeball and basketball with our fifth quarter kids. There was times when we only ever saw the fourth quarter of the football game. Those times when it went into overtime and we realized we were really out past our bedtimes. But in that time, we shared board games and laughter and snacks. And Jesus was shared with our young people. And it was a beautiful thing. Some of us endured paperwork by the mounds. 
And meetings, some of those meetings were made better with the presence of birthday cake. We raised a roof, if you didn't remember that, and finished a garage as well. And all the while, we were seeking to be good stewards of the gifts that God has given to us. And of course, we worshipped. We worshipped inside, we worshipped outside, we worshipped at the park, we worshipped at Camp Conger, we worshipped at the campgrounds. We worshipped with music, without music, with many in the pews, with just a few in the pews, and even with none in the pews. We worshipped in our homes, in our cars, on our back porches with barking dogs and trains and cats and heat. We broke bread together. You might not remember, but we had a tortilla once. Thank you, Duane. You found that in the freezer. And even at home, we worshipped and had communion with whatever we had on hand. And ultimately, that is the beauty of the holy mystery of Christ, meeting us wherever and in whatever form we need or that we can experience at the time. And whether I was right about it or, or wrong about it, it was never about the rules or the laws. It was always about the people, about the people meeting Christ at the table. God's people, that's you and that's me. And it's also them, those outside. And so I'm thinking about how grateful I am for the people, the ones in this room, the ones joining us online, the ones who call this place their church in some way, shape, or form. I am eternally grateful for the privilege it has been to be part of your lives, to share in wedding days and birthdays, anniversaries, in baptism and confirmation and graduation, in the anticipation and the celebration of new life. And I'm grateful for the opportunity that we have shared together in the sacred privilege of mourning together as well. It has been an honor to walk this road with each of you. So I thank you once more for this journey, for this opportunity that it has been, for the time that this church taught me how to serve and how to follow Jesus more deeply. I thank you for the many prayers and encouragement, for the kindness you have shown to my family. In a few moments, we will experience together the message that God has prepared for us today. And as I have always tried to do, I'm going to give you Jesus yet again. Because ultimately, our time together has never been about me. It has never been really about us. But it has always been about the one that loves us and calls us to love one another as we have first been loved. So friends, we do think about giving our gifts back to God at this time. And we do so with grateful hearts. And we are yet again thankful for this opportunity that we have had to grow in faith, to grow in love for one another, and our love for Christ. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you have gifted us immeasurably in life, in love, in ministry, in family, and in faith. Lord, we offer back to you today those gifts that you have poured upon us we ask that you would take them, that you would bless them, and continue to show us the way to use them, that others will know how much you love them. We pray all this in the holy and precious name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I think I'm also supposed to remind you that there's a reception downstairs after worship if you can stay. Um, instead of greeting you at the sanctuary door, I'll greet you at the bottom of the stairs. And um, unless you have a hall pass, you'll be strong-armed into staying. So 
beer. I know Dave already gave me his hall pass. Something about drinking beer. I don't know. <laughs> Selling it, drinking it, whatever you want to go. <laughs> so we'll now share in our joys and our concerns. Are there those that you would lift up today? So continued prayers for Virginia. She is um, going through her cancer treatments and a uh, long road ahead of her. Are there others? Yes, Betty. The family of Rick Ingram, who has passed away. Are there others? joys or concerns that you would lift up this morning. Oh, Matt. <laughs> I wrote mine down. Um, a joy and uh, a concern. Um, just a joy for having you as our pastor. That's been absolutely uh, fantastic and a, a, not a concern, but a prayers for just next steps, uh, new chapters in life. Um, so I, I wrote a couple things down, so I didn't blubber, but you guys, um, Leanne said everything perfectly. Uh, uh, this just, yeah, came to me, so I, I wrote it down. Um, back in the day, uh, when people used to write let letters to one another, there'd be occasions after the letter was finished and it was signed that another thought would cross the mind of the writer. And so under their signature, they would write two little letters, the letter P and the letter S. And those letters would be followed by a finishing thought. Those two little letters, P and S, stand for postscript, or postscriptum, if you're into Latin origins. Literally translated, postscriptum means written after, or after text. It is an additional thought added to a letter. According to Wikipedia, a postscript lets you reiterate an important point that has already been addressed in the letter that helps create emphasis where it is most needed. Now I want you to take that little bit of knowledge and put it in your pocket and hold on to it a minute. Because for over the past six years, you and I have had the privilege of getting to know another PS. That's Pastor Sarah. Today marks the last scheduled opportunity for her to stand behind that pulpit and share God's word with us. We've been incredibly blessed because she said yes to God's call in her life. And I pray that if it's God's will, that hopefully maybe someday she'll stand back up there again maybe one more time and share with us. God is funny, and I hope that's okay to say. I don't know what your relationship with him is life, like, but he definitely works in mysterious ways, and that's at least in my life. I was backing in my truck into the garage last night, and those two little letters hit me out of nowhere for some reason. P.S., like written in the letter. Why, I don't know, but I couldn't remember what it meant, so I had to look them up. I honestly thought that they stood for please stand by, like, hold on a minute, I have something else to say. So in my head, that's, that's what it meant. And I guess that's kind of what it means. But when I read the definition online, it all made sense. A postscript lets you reiterate an important point that's already been addressed in the letter, and it helps create emphasis where it's most needed. That's where it hit me. We have the Bible. God gave us this 66-book love letter to show us exactly how to live. Now it's big and it's deep and it's wide and there's a lot of words in there and there are very few pictures, which makes it hard for somebody like me. And it's confusing and it's beautiful and it's hard to read and understand sometimes, but God gave us a PS um, that spent the last six years reiterating important parts that have already been addressed in the letter to help create emphasis where it was most needed. Pastor Sarah did her job, exactly what God asks every pastor to do. And she did it very well. God has blessed us. So this is entitled, To Whom It May Concern. Which is <laughs> funny because it was meant to be whimsical. <laughs> and fun because Leanne and Pastor Sarah came up with this pact and they promised each other that things would be light. And so that's what I tried to do. But when I read it, it wasn't as light as I'd hoped. Um, so to whom it may concern. Concern. I am writing this day in a peculiar, peculiar little way, which some may say is a bit old-fashioned. 
We gather in this, split, in this space, blessed to worship face to face, and we celebrate the, fi the finish of another chapter. Many pastors have stood behind this pulpit of wood to share the good news of the gospel. Nearly 200 years, these walls have had ears, and God's word has echoed around them. Countless butts filled these pews to hear the good news that each pastor was sent here to share. Each shared a, a bit of their story, to God be the glory for each blessed in their own little way. Pastor Sarah heard the call, and she gave it her all, and for that we are forever grateful. Our hearts have been changed, and our thoughts rearranged, and our purpose has never been more clear. Seeking loving and growing with hearts that are knowing the world needs us now more than ever. New chapters begin. Our story doesn't end. For next week, most will be right back here. Bonded by one love that's sent from above, space between won't ruin the friendship. When you can, please come visit. We won't say who is it. We'll welcome you with open arms. Hope this letter finds you well, and we hope you can tell you are leaving us much better than you found us. Grace and peace go with you and your better half, too. Sincerely, your crew, this church. Oh, and P.S., we love you. Thank you. We love you, too. <laughs> you did well. You did well. <laughs> it's very Dr. Seuss-like. So. <laughs> Um, any other joys or concerns that you would lift up today? I've got a couple to share with you. If Okay. Um, John Morrow. Okay, family of John Morrow who passed away. Also, um, we would ask prayers for the family of Linda Linda Camp. We've been praying for her since her cancer diagnosis not all that many weeks ago, and she passed away yesterday. So prayers for her, her husband, Don, and her girls and their um, families as well. Um, prayers for those in Miami who are um, trapped, lost, missing in their homes, um, in the building that has collapsed, and, and also for the first responders who are working tirelessly um, in the heat and the dangerous conditions. And I'm not sure if you've read the ways that they're attempting to save people, but it's um, pretty amazing and, and, and risky. So prayers for, for everyone involved there. Um, also, if you pay attention to the weather much or other places in the country, there's a heat wave out west. My sister um, in the Pacific Northwest, who most people don't have air conditioning, but she does, is 104 degrees tomorrow. So people are just pretty uncomfortable in many places, so we pray for them. That's some dangerous heat for folks who are not accustomed to it and don't have the resources to cool down. Um, any other joys or concerns that you would lift up today? Okay. I would ask that we continue um, prayers for Ted and Sherry as they come to be with you next week and, and to bring their ministry to this place. Um, today they are dedicating the prayer garden at New Haven to Pastor Bob, and so our, our hearts are with them today as they do that as well. Any others? Okay, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious and loving God, um, we don't always have the, the right words to pray, but we're, we're calling out to you today. We're bringing our joys before you. What a, what a gift you have given to each of us in this place, in this faith family, and for that, we are thankful. We, we don't have words for the gratitude that we have for you today. Lord, we Pray that you would keep this faith family focused, um, that as Pastor Ted and Sherry come to share their ministry here, that it too will be a match made by your hands. Lord, I just ask that you would fill everyone with your grace and your peace as they move into a new chapter together. For everything that we're thankful for, um, those things that we've mentioned, those that we haven't because... They're too numerous to mention. We also have many prayers on our list today that we bring to you. We bring to you those families who are mourning today, Linda's family, John's family, Rick's family, and we just ask that you would be with them, that you would wrap them in your loving arms, bring them peace and comfort today. We lift up those who are missing, those who are wondering if someone will find them, we pray for those who are searching for them. Lord, we just ask that you would give them strength, that you would protect 
as only you can. Lord, we just ask for a special healing to take place. We lift up those who are experiencing heat waves, Lord. We ask for protection as well. We pray for Virginia. She has a long road ahead of her, Lord. We just ask that you would bring her strength and comfort, that those who care for her would do so with mercy and with grace. And we pray for next steps, uh, not just for this faith family, but for all faith families that are facing next steps today. Lord, you have been with us. Increase our faith that we know that you will be with us. We bring all of this to you today as your children, as your disciples, as those who have been taught to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand as you are able and join us in our next hymn, number 399, Take My Life and Let It Be. Please stand. Our New Testament reading today comes from Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her that she, so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. 
because she thought to herself, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd, and he asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. May God add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we pray that these familiar words would speak to our hearts in a new way today would increase the grace that we know that flows from you. Lord, would help us to give that grace away. And we pray all of this in the holy name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. So I've approached the writing of this message today in my mind many times, and I stressed about what was the right topic to cover. What did God want me to share with you on this day? Not this final day that we will be together, but on this day. Because I believe in my spirit that this is not the final time that we will be in ministry together, just perhaps maybe in this form. So I looked up common passages that pastors would use when they're moving, whether they're retiring or, or going to a new appointment. And they were all wonderful passages, passages about God taking us into the promised land, grand stories from Exodus where God defeated the enemies of the people and, and led them towards the promised land. But although it is warm in here, we're not walking in the desert. Instead, we are looking forward to the many ways in which God has planned to use the gifts of Pastor Ted and Sherry combined with the gifts of this faith community to continue to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are already in the land which we have been called to. We are already in the mission field. And we are looking forward to the new ways in which God has planned for us to live in and to serve that mission field. We know that the grace of God is in this place. We have experienced the grace of God in our lives. And so I wondered to myself, what do we do with what we already know? What do we do with what has been given to us? What do we do with the grace that has been with this faith family, as Matt said, some 200 years? So I was thinking about this break room that we have at my secular job, my 9 to 5 job. We have a break room, and in this break room, hardly anyone ever eats their lunch. It has this refrigerator from 1982 that will never die, although it sometimes smells like it has. There's a garbage can that seems to be invisible to the human eye when it's full. There's a television that only one person knows how to operate. That's Walt. If you want to work it, you've got to find Walt. There's a toaster oven that showed up one day, and I think it's for burning things, 
so that the whole building smells like your lunch. And then there is this table. It's a common table. It's, it's, there's nothing fancy about this table, but I want to talk about this table in the break room. This table is the place of sharing. If you brought in a treat for your birthday, it goes on the table. If you had leftover cake from your niece's wedding, it goes on the table. An abundance of zucchini from your garden, put it on the table. Cleaning out your desk before you quit, put those extra pens and those coffee cups from the vendors on the table. By the end of the day, it's all gone. The break room table is for the stuff that you want to give away. There have been many times where I threatened to put my kids on that table. <laughs> Sorry, kids. The magical break room table is for giving things away. In fact, on Friday, I got one of those little tiny baby crock pots. It was there. I took it home. Didn't have one, so. That is what we do when we have too much of something, right? Too much from our garden? Give it away. <whistles> Made too big of a batch of soup? Give it away. Cleaned out your closet, realized <whistles> no one person needs 17 sweater vests? Give them away. Without thinking about it for too long or agonizing over it for too long, we're pretty good at giving away what we have in abundance. We easily give the extra away. I think it's because we can see it. We can see the thing that we have too much of. Too much zucchini, too much cupcakes, too many sweater vests. And so it's easy to give it away when we can see that we still have what we need, right? It's a little bit more tricky to give away what we cannot see. It's tricky to give away what we can't count. Giving away something that we can't store on the shelf and feel secure about it because we can see that we still have enough. That's a different story. It's, it's a lot more challenging than giving away what we have in abundance. That kind of giving requires faith. That kind of giving requires confidence in the giver of those things that sustain us, those things that we cannot see, those things that we cannot quantify. In the six short years that we've been together, I have witnessed and experienced the grace and the power of God in this place time and time again. I cannot count it. I cannot tell you that God has given this faith community two tons of grace, and that's all that we're going to get. And so we have to be wise with what we do with it because grace doesn't work that way. Grace is immeasurable. Grace doesn't require replenishment. The grace vending machine is never out of order and it doesn't even take your dollar bills anyway. And so it would seem to me that we have an abundance of grace the very presence and power of God in us, and yet it is still sometimes a challenge to give it away. So I wonder to myself, we have so much, why do we struggle to give it away? As followers of Jesus, we often say that Jesus is our example for living. In Jesus, not only do we see the very character of God, but in the life and the ministry of Jesus, we see the example for our lives as disciples, as those who are following Christ. In Jesus, we see his willingness to sit with and to share life with all types of people, from all walks of life, from all backgrounds. He'll sit with the saints and the sinners alike. In Christ, we see a willingness to, willingness to dine with enemies and even to forgive our betrayers. In Christ, we see peace in the storm. We see confidence in our Heavenly Father. We see sacrificial love and acceptance and forgiveness. In Christ, we see patience with the young and with the old alike, 
patience with the doubter and with the demonized. In Jesus, we see self-giving love and healing. And as I was thinking about these attributes, what strikes me most about Christ and who he was, how he lived, how he loved, how he served, was his willingness to give it all away. He willingly gave love and patience and mercy. He gave forgiveness and acceptance. Quite simply, Jesus gave away grace like his shelves were full of it, like he would never run out. He just keeps putting grace out on the table for the taking. In our passage from Mark today, we have these two examples of Jesus giving away grace like it's never going to run out. Like the well of his grace will never run dry. We read that Jesus has crossed back over the lake, that Sea of Galilee that we were on last week in the storm. The storm that Jesus calmed and his friends had accused him of not caring for them at all. We recognize that storms are an inevitable part of life, but that in Jesus we find our refuge. We find the one that cares for us infinitely more than any storm can ever damage us. So when we catch up with Jesus today, we know that he's been working hard. He's been healing and and calming storms and caring for people, for all people. If we read the passage before the one we read today, we would read the story of Jesus casting demons into a herd of pigs, and he sent them flying over a cliff, teaching us that pigs really do fly. And what we would learn in these previous passages is that word about Jesus has gotten around. Some people are intrigued by him. Some are actually coming to believe in him and to follow him, and then there's others that just want him to go away. He makes them fearful by what he is doing. They are afraid of his power. So Jesus has come back likely to Capernaum, the place where he spends a good amount of his ministry. When he arrives, of course, he finds this large crowd waiting for him. There's there's no moments to rest. And very soon, Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, approaches Jesus and he falls at his feet and he begs Jesus to come to his home to heal his little daughter who is dying. This was a big deal. It was a big deal for Jairus to approach Jesus like this. Because by this time in the ministry of Jesus, the religious leaders and the Pharisees, they were already looking for ways to discredit him and to get rid of him. And so as a leader in the synagogue, Jairus had ties to, and he worked with the Pharisees. So he was risking his very reputation by coming to Jesus. But this was his little girl. And he had heard about the healing of Jesus. And so he risked reaching out. He risked all that he had. And he put faith in the only one who could heal his little girl. Jesus, of course, agrees to go with Jairus to lie hands upon the little girl. And as Jesus is following Jairus to his home through this crowd, a crowd that is elbow to elbow, there was no social distancing going on, there is a woman in the crowd and she is making her way. And she is probably pushing her way through this crowd because as a woman she was not seen. This woman has been afflicted by bleeding for 12 years, for the same amount of time that Jairus' daughter has been alive. She has seen every physician, every witch doctor imaginable. She has taken every medication and every snake oil that she could find, and she's found no healing. Mark tells us, in fact, that her condition has worsened. And this woman, like Jairus, is taking a big risk in seeking Jesus on this day. Due to her condition, she is always ceremonially unclean. She is excluded from community life. She is not to touch or be touched. She is to live in seclusion. But on this day, she can wait no longer. 
Jesus is near and she's going to take her chances. And so I imagine that she has attempted to disguise herself so that no one recognizes her and throws her out of the crowd. She's pushing her way through the crowd, making everyone unclean as she bumps into them. If they found out, they would probably stone her. She finally gets close to Jesus, and she decides to herself that if she only touches the hem of his garment, that that'll be enough, and she'll be healed. Jesus is moving through this crowd himself, and she manages to touch the hem of his garment. Mark writes that immediately she is relieved of her affliction. She feels that she has been freed from suffering. And in this moment, Jesus stops in this crowd that's moving with him, and he says to the crowd, Who touched my clothes? Because he felt power. He, he felt grace leaving him. The disciples, of course, think he's crazy. They say to him, in this crowd, how could you ever say, who touched me? Everybody's touching you. The woman comes to Jesus, and like Jairus, she falls at his feet. Mark writes that she's trembling with fear. I don't think she's fearful of Jesus, but fearful of this crowd. She tells Jesus the whole story. And he is ever patient with her. He calls her daughter. He tells her that her faith has healed her, and she should go and live in peace and be free. Eventually, Jesus makes it to the home of Jairus. He finds that all the others there think that the girl is already dead. They have already begun their mourning rituals. Jesus goes to the little girl, and he commands her to get up, and she gets up, and she walks around, and and he says to the family, she needs a snack. She's been through a lot. And so we see the faith of Jairus. We see the faith of the woman pushing her way through the crowd. This faith that brought them both to the feet, literally, of Jesus. We know that Jesus is a busy guy, right? He's a man on a mission. He had troubles of his own dealing with these unbelieving disciples and these annoying Pharisees. And yet Jesus is not irritated with those who come to his feet looking for grace. He responds to their faith with abundant grace and healing. He responds with a grace like it's never going to run out. Jesus had grace for the one who begged him for it and the one who stole it. There was plenty to go around. There is enough grace for Jesus to keep putting it out on the table, and in faith we get to keep coming back for more. We have each of us been blessed in abundant grace. That's the very power and the presence of God in our lives. We have seen that evidence. There's enough for today. There's enough for tomorrow. There's enough to get us on through to that final victory lap. And so we can be more like Jesus. And we can give that stuff away. We can be more like Jesus and give away grace every chance that we get. We can be more like Jesus and give away love every chance that we get. We can be more like Jesus and extend mercy every chance that we get. Because there's plenty there. Jesus has laid it all out for us. We don't have to beg for it, but it is nice to recognize and thank the giver. We don't have to sneak or even steal a little bit of grace for ourselves, but it's nice to recognize the source. We have this assurance in the source and the giver of grace. This assurance that there is enough for today, there is Enough for tomorrow that it won't run out. So just give it away. 
give it away on the table, on the street, at home, give the grace away at the workplace, at the playground, give the grace away in the hospital room, in the parking lot, just give it away. I thank you once again from the bottom of my heart for the grace that you have each given to me. And I pray today that the God of all abundant grace will continue to encourage you, to equip you, and to give you the strength to keep on giving that grace away. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the abundant grace that you never hold back from us. We thank you that when we beg for it or steal it, when we don't even realize that we need it, that you give it away. Lord, do a work in us that we would know fully in our hearts, in our spirits, that you have given us enough grace to give it away. We pray all of this in the holy name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Friends, please stand as you are able. Join us in our closing hymn, number 369, Blessed Assurance. Please stand. And now go in the abundant grace and love and peace and mercy of Jesus Christ and give it away today, tomorrow, and forever. Amen.